Hi everyone, if you're watching this on YouTube, can you please click the big red subscribe button below this video and share it on social media. This keeps all our content ad free, spreads the word of Bitcoin to others like yourself. Everything is available at bitcoinbasicspodcast.com, including our podcast platforms and an upcoming free webinar. All right, on to the show. This was the beauty of the, the, the release time of Bitcoin 2008, was we're at the um, height of the global financial crisis. Governments were too busy to pay attention to Bitcoin. They actually could have very easily controlled it back then, but they were just too busy with the global financial crisis, which is what we are potentially on the cusp of again today. This Mexican beer crisis that has sparked a sell-off in markets um, could potentially just be the beginning of, an, of another huge global financial crisis. So I think they're just going to be too busy to pay attention to Bitcoin again. This is the Bitcoin Basics Podcast with your hosts Ferris, that's me, and Gordon from CoinCompass.com. We're Bitcoin advisors and educators supporting business and individual investors to safely buy, store, and control their private keys, Bitcoins. This podcast is strictly educational and is not intended to be financial, investment, or legal advice. Full disclaimer in the show notes and at the end of this episode. Welcome back, everyone. It is day nine of our 30 Days of Bitcoin on the Bitcoin Basics podcast. Proof of recording. The current block time or block height is 623,297. The current price of Bitcoin is 6,186 US dollars, according to Bitstamp. And this is March the 28th. And Faris, it seems like at least five minutes since our last podcast. Yeah, probably even less. Yeah. So let's get straight into part two. Part one, we talked about decentralization. Um, a reminder of the question. One of the things that makes Bitcoin really interesting to me is its ability to decentralize uh, currency. I mean, a lot of problems have come with government monopolies over currency. Um, and that the ability of the technology to the peer-to-peer -peer technology to decentralize that authority is good in a lot of ways, but it also makes it a threat to the, those power structures. And I'm curious <clears throat> what the ramifications are of that. Like we've seen countries uh, make moves to try to uh, keep people from using uh, Bitcoin. I wonder how you see that playing out. Can can countries and governments, power structures, uh, can they keep people from using Bitcoin? Can they pass laws against it? Uh, can they um, uh, can they wage like an economic war on it and sort of drive down the currency? What are the things that can be done to uh, fight against uh, Bitcoin? And uh, do you see those as uh, being problematic? to investment in the currency? Again, great question, thought provoking. And I will list some of the possible threats to Bitcoin. And- Sorry, Gordon, uh, sorry, you go. before you do, we do want, we do want to mention that we, we addressed the first part of this question in our previous episode. So this was such a loaded question that we split it into two. So episode one, we talked about decentralization and peer to peer. Uh, this episode, we're talking about the second part of the question, which is threats to Bitcoin and driving down the currency. Sorry, Gordon. No, excellent recap. So I'm not going to get too conspiratorial, but I was just thinking about some of the threats to Bitcoin because I don't want to be one of those Bitcoiners who's like, yeah, Bitcoin's going to survive forever. There are no threats. Um, don't worry about it. As I turn off my air conditioner. So... I'm just going to list some of the threats and Faris, you can take over from there. The unlikely but possible threats to Bitcoin, at least in my opinion, besides the fact that there could be some kind of uh, technological event that, you know, wipes out all technology, we've probably got other bigger problems um, than not being able to um, get our Bitcoin. We're all sort of using fire and stone and that kind of stuff. Some of the threats could be some sort of government-sponsored uh, attack on Bitcoin, whether that's to attack the hash rate or what is the computational power, the computing power of the network. Maybe that's a quantum computing. So for example, the government 
could co-opt a university or universities or maybe Google or one of the organizations to use quantum computing to attack or reverse the Bitcoin network. There could be some software bugs in Bitcoin, whether they're unintentional bugs. There have been bugs in the past, some really serious bugs, like the ability to basically print infinite amounts of Bitcoin. That could also be co-opted. So there could be, for example, some three-letter agencies posing as Bitcoin developers, and they could sneak some backdoor stuff in there. There could be some sort of censorship and sabotage. So for example, internet service providers could have a decree from the government to say, yeah, we're not gonna allow any Bitcoin traffic. That actually would be a fairly huge um, attack on Bitcoin, because you can imagine um, people's homes and offices or even Wi-Fi's, uh, Wi-Fi from cafes banning Bitcoin traffic. But in my mind, there are really four realistic threats to Bitcoin. One is centralization, and that is the centralization of mining and Bitcoin development, software development. Two is regulation and laws banning Bitcoin. Three are competing currencies. And four, I'd have to say it's a little bit um, out of left field, is some kind of self-destruction. There was some argument within the Bitcoin community it forked or it basically split like it's done in the past and people lose interest and basically Bitcoin sort of um, doesn't get adopted and sort of everyone sort of loses interest and gets bored. Um, that's what I came up with. Uh, how about you, Faris? Okay. So I've just been writing down Gordon's stuff and um, so I want everyone to actually just respect where Gordon's coming from. He worked in um operational security and information security is that correct gordon am i remembering that accurately yes infosec okay infosec and opsec for one of australia's largest banks so gordon actually comes from this background where this is what he did he prepared and planned for the worst for one of australia's largest banks this is his professional background that he's bringing to bitcoin so gordon is the type of guy where he actually does do his research and prepare for law, the worst case scenarios. Now, a lot of what Gordon said will make sense to, uh, will not make sense to a lot of you, and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I just want everyone to respect where he's coming from, the fact that he actually does do this work on a daily basis, and he simply does not want to be naive um, or look at Bitcoin through rose tinted glasses, which is why we go through this stuff together and we actually advise people on these, these threats. So, I want to go through so all the stuff that Gordon mentioned, um, electromagnetic pulse, wiping out Bitcoin. We, we, I, we've heard this argument many times. Not worried about it. That happens. So many other things to concern about. Mm -hmm. uh, government attack on the hash rate. That is something where we will have to talk about in a more detailed episode. Just a reminder, this Bitcoin basics is just the basics. Uh, a hash rate, 51% attack. These are things you don't need to know, but if you want to know, we will explain them in a separate episode. Uh, software bugs. This is actually an interesting one because this is an internal threat. So things I would actually agree with Gordon on is my concerns for Bitcoin would be internal threats and not external ones. And any historians will know governments, sorry, not governments, empires fall from within. They fall because they branch out too far, spread themselves too thin, and loosen their defenses. I would say Bitcoin the same way is a threat to Bitcoin would not be from external forces, but from internal ones. Um, and in a separate episode, which we'll have to dig up, we've talked about open source, where Bitcoin is open source, much like Linux, um, and that's actually much more beneficial. Another separate podcast entirely for that one. Uh, so Gordon's key concern where it's ISP, Internet Service Providers being pushed down Bitcoin. We've seen this being attempted in China and India, and you can just, if you know what you're doing, you can just go to an exchange in Japan, you know, an exchange anywhere else. I do not see a coordinated global attack on Bitcoin. Um, there are some countries who see Bitcoin as, there's a lot of people that made money in Bitcoin, it is the future. There's a lot of jobs in blockchain. I don't see that happening. I don't see a global coordinated attack on Bitcoin. Mining centralization, it's actually becoming more and more decentralized. If you don't understand what I've just said, I will point you to a newsletter where we wrote about this. 
Regulation, same as ISPs. I'm not worried about it. So competing currency, this is something I do want to talk about. Um, and this was what the question brought up, is how can governments basically, um, how did he phrase it, sorry? Um, uh, drive down the currency. So drive down the currency means how can they attack it and drive down the price? Now, it's possible to do, and it would be very, very, very expensive. I think we did the math of like $60 trillion to attack Bitcoin. But you have to ask yourself, why are they doing it? Um, Sorry, right. yep, Gordon, you have something at this point. Yeah, I knew, I knew this would come up, and I, I, I won't go into it, I promise. But according to Crypto51.app, currently, as of March 28, 2020, it would take $556,722, half a million dollars US, to maintain an attack on the Bitcoin network. Do you want to learn how to safely buy and securely store your Bitcoins? Coin Compass is running a free two-hour webinar on Sunday, the 19th of April. For session times and a register, go to coincompass.com forward slash webinar. Yeah, so with that, I remember going to that and that was just explaining it per minute. But um, so I did the math and I think it came to about $60 trillion to completely reverse engineer the network. Not reverse engineer, but destroy the existing blockchain of 10 years. So... We don't want to go into detail on that, but it would basically cost a lot and a lot of money to do so. Um, right now, um, you know, we're at the end of March, government's already facing a global pandemic. Um, and this was the beauty of the, the, the release time of Bitcoin 2008, was we're at the um, height of the global financial crisis. Governments were too busy to pay attention to Bitcoin. They actually could have very easily controlled it back then, but they were just too busy with the global financial crisis which is what we are potentially on the cusp of again today. This corona, um, sorry, I have to edit that out. This Mexican beer crisis that has sparked a sell-off in markets um, could potentially just be the beginning of, an, of another huge global financial crisis. So I think they're just going to be too busy to pay attention to Bitcoin again. And so yeah, very, very good question. But um, yeah, I don't see external threats to Bitcoin. Because there's just nothing, it's just too robust and too expensive to go after. And the network has actually been growing for 10 years. And uh, Gordon mentioned boredom, it could die boredom. I don't see that happening. There's just so much development going on. Uh, last year, we saw a lot of hedge funds, private money, people that control billions of investment money start to get on board. So we are seeing the beginning of a new wave of people getting into Bitcoin. Yeah, very good points, Faris. I want to bring up one point, which is nuanced because a lot of this um, is new technology and uh, sometimes we do get lost in the weeds. There's really two layers at work here. There's Bitcoin, the technology. So that's, at the end of the day, it's an amazing technology and invention, but it's a software. and it's not nothing magical, it's software or a protocol. And then there's another layer, which is all the businesses that Faris mentioned. So all the businesses, all the Bitcoin exchanges, all the mining providers, Bitcoin ATMs, and all those periphery, that's kind of like your layer two. What we're really talking about are attacks mostly at that layer two. So China and India have banned Bitcoin. They've said, you know, you can't use Bitcoin exchanges, but it's Faris said. What did the Chinese do? They just use VPNs and connect it into Bitcoin exchanges in South Korea. So there could be something that um, participate, um, exacerbates uh, some kind of attack on Bitcoin, but that would attack all the businesses and all those at the layer two level. And there's always ways around it. There's VPNs, there's all kinds of technology to circumvent that. You can't really ban it at the layer one level, because it's an idea. And once you invent something, I'm not sure who said this, once you invent it, you can't uninvent it. So it kind of be like trying to ban electricity or trying to ban an idea or trying to ban music, for example. You can't ban music, but you could certainly ban the record companies or you could ban YouTube from playing music or whatever like that. So there's theoretical and there's what you can do in practice. So I can't see 
um, even if a couple of countries banning Bitcoin and Bitcoin merchants, there's going to be what is called regulation arbitrage, which means those businesses, say based in China or India or whatever country bans it, they're just going to move somewhere else. And some of the main Bitcoin exchanges, the reason why they're not based in the US and they're based in Malta and all these other island nations is that um, they don't come under the regulation of the US. So there's always going to be a way around for businesses, for Bitcoin, for developers, for pretty much everyone to be liquid and fluid and basically circumvent, go around any regulation laws or any sort of censorship. Yeah, that's a really good point that Gordon just brought up there, the layer one and layer two. I actually had not thought of it that way. That's excellent. And um, if you go to our website, uh, coincompass.com forward slash newsletter, our March and April newsletters are actually about this topic because we're seeing huge shifts right now around the US dollar and global currencies. Um, and there's a quote in there. I actually don't know. I can't remember if someone had who it's from, but it reads, um, First, they laugh at you, then they fight you, then they join you. And they laugh at Bitcoin, then they then fought you win. it. And now we're seeing, and then you win. Thank you. Um, yeah, first they laugh at you. Don't stop at laughing. Find you, then they join you, then you win. So what we're seeing now, we're actually towards the beginning of the join stage. People, we're seeing um, global governments now basically start to say, oh, we want to adopt their own digital cryptocurrency. So that's what we've been writing about in this latest newsletters. The governments are now saying, well, hang on, this Bitcoin thing is actually not going anywhere. Maybe we should look at implementing this technology ourselves. So they're at the joining phase now. They sure are. And a lot of people are worried about uh, the threat of digital currencies, like, for example, what the US is doing. If you want to collect the $2,000 from the Fed, you have to um, open up your mobile phone and download it on a digital app and stuff like that, that's going to completely uh, destroy Bitcoin and compete with Bitcoin. It's totally um, amazing for Bitcoin. People are going to get yeah. this uh, gateway drug of um, Facebook's Libra coin, the Fed coin, digital dollars. And uh, after a while, maybe not immediately, they're going to see Bitcoin, they're going to see the properties of Bitcoin, and they're going to be, wow, I've got this digital dollar, but it's being printed infinitum. Prices are going up, inflation's going up got this Bitcoin thing. You can't print it. There's only 21 million. Let me get into that. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree with Gordon Moore. Absolutely. What Super we're seeing bullish. now on a, macro, on a macroeconomic level is actually very good for the coin. All right. Well, uh, we hope we've answered that question. And remember, everyone, if you think we haven't answered that your question, please get into contact. If you have your own question, go to www.coincompass.com forward slash ask and upload any question. And uh, Gordon, what else can people find at coincompass.com? I don't know of anything they can find at coincompass.com. <laughs> Educational <laughs> material. We've actually done quite a few YouTube series, so video guides on that I'm going to update, buying Bitcoin, storing Bitcoin. Of course, our podcast. And uh, Faris also does some market Bitcoin and markets updates from time to time. And uh, newsletters, as he said, and eBooks and everything else so hit that up share it with your friends and um we hope you are enjoying our 30 days of bitcoin great thank you everyone until next time thanks for watching or listening please visit coincompass.com free to register to our socials and discover other free content subscribing liking and following helps this content remain ad free until next time